everyone and welcome to Rainier View. My name is Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you that are new with us, we have several resources for you at rainierview.org slash RVCC online. These include a great lesson for your kids, links to our youth materials and more. You can also submit a connection card to let us know a little bit about you and your family, as well as prayer requests so members of our team can be praying for your needs. We're gonna have a couple of worship songs followed by a message, and then Pastor Mike will close us out and lead us in a time of communion. Again, thanks so much for being here with us and enjoy the service. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing holy is the lord god almighty earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory the earth and the earth is filled with his glory we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the lord our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing holy is the lord god almighty filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory and the earth is filled with his glory and it's rising up all around it's the anthem of Lord's renown, it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, and the earth is filled with His glory. And holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, and the earth is filled with His glory, the earth, and the earth is filled with His glory. In thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father 
great reminder to fix our eyes on God who loves us without condition. God is good. We are his and he loves us. We want to make sure that you're staying connected during this time. And here are some ways to do that. You can sign up to receive our church emails. You can join us on Facebook for our daily rhythms where someone from our staff or a friend of our staff shares about what God has been teaching them during this time. And you can follow us on Instagram. Coffee Oasis is one of our local partners. They might sound familiar to you because we serve their coffee on Sunday mornings. They're a nonprofit organization that is working to provide poverty alleviation services, shelter, counseling, and rehabilitation services for homeless youth. As a nonprofit organization in this season of COVID-19, they need a little extra help. We realize that many of you have significant financial challenges in this time. 
We don't want anyone to feel pressure to give. But if you can help above and beyond your regular giving to Rainier View, we would encourage you to give an extra gift to Coffee Oasis this morning. Your gifts to them, no matter how small you may think they are, can make a huge impact to some of the most vulnerable in our communities here in Pierce County. It's your continued generosity that allows us to partner with organizations like Coffee Oasis. If you call Rainier View your church home, you can give by simply texting RVCC to 77977 to use our safe and secure online system. If you prefer to mail in a check, we're checking that every day as well. If you're new with us, please don't feel obligated to give in any way. We're just so glad that you're here today. All right, let's join Erica as we wrap up our series, Influencers. Hey everyone, I'm Erica. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are in our second and final week of a series called Influencers, where we have looked at two of the primary places that God can use to influence us, our churches and our homes. Jeff preached a great sermon last week on the influence of the church and how if we step into it, we can experience such incredible things for ourselves and for our communities. And today I'm talking about our homes. And if we're honest, home is kind of a weird concept right now, right? It's, it's taken on a whole new style and way of operating than it ever has before. Um, if you're a person who's been able to work from home, you're just like, get me out of here. I keep telling people I work from my home and I home from my work. It's just, that's how it feels. And if you're a person who's not been able to work from home, if you've been an essential worker, first of all, thank you, my goodness. Second of all, you're like, can I be home more? You're tired of hearing me complain. I promise. I'm done complaining now. But home just looks different for all of us. And I think that most of us would agree there is nothing that beats the feeling of coming home. I was actually talking with a friend of mine the other day, and she said that her toddler uh, looked at her and said, Mom, I want to go home. To which my friend said, uh, we've been home for weeks. I don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> But what she ultimately realized is that her toddler misses being able to go somewhere and then come back home. She misses that feeling. And I remember being in high school and I had this awesome opportunity to travel for three weeks. Um, and I went to Italy and France and Greece and it was so cool and it was this student ambassador trip. And there was a person on our trip named Demi, but we called them DJ Demi. And their sole responsibility on the trip was to pick the music that we listened to on the bus traveling from different places. And every time DJ Demi crushed it, except we were about three days from getting on an airplane to come home. And it was the first time DJ Demi let us down because through the speakers came the sounds of Michael Buble singing Another sunny day has come and gone away in Paris and Rome, and I want to go home. I miss you so. And suddenly there is a bus full of blubbering, sobbing teenagers who are loving the opportunity that we're having, but also missing being home. Because home is the place that we get to be ourselves. Home is the place where our hearts get to exhale a little bit. Home is comforting. Home is a gift. For some of you though, maybe home looks a little bit different. Maybe it hasn't played out exactly the way that you wanted to. Maybe for you, home is you're the sports team you've been on, or it's a place in nature, or it's the library. Please know that in this sermon, every time I say home, I mean that place where you get to be yourself, where your heart gets to exhale. I mean that for whatever that circumstance looks like, where you have some power and some influence in that space. We often ignore or miss how powerful our homes can actually be until we have to come to grips with it. Until we realize, wow, my home experience could have been so different if only someone had been around more, or maybe someone had been around less. Or maybe you're coming to terms with the fact that this traditional idea of home has maybe been lost because of some of the mistakes that you've made and you're just feeling in a weird spot. Home can be complicated. And if I had a time machine, I would go back in time to all of your homes and I would change it. I would be able to do whatever I can to make that thing that didn't feel right about your traditional home experience feel better. I know that that breaks the rules of time travel though, but here's the deal. No one has actually proven that time travel works to me and this is my sermon, so we're gonna go with it. But 
I don't have a time machine, so I can't actually do this. But that doesn't mean that you don't have the ability right now to begin to make changes in your home, in your space, in your environment to a way that God's glory can be made known. But here's the deal. We don't get to just say, I want my home to be a place like that. And then it just happens. There's some work that has to go into it. God meets us in it and then we do some stuff. We enter a partnership with him for our homes to be places where people get to know him. We open our hearts to God and then God convicts us and then things begin to change. But before we jump in, there are a few things that I want to make abundantly clear. First of all, this will not be a sermon about how Extreme Makeover Home Edition is going to wildly change and make everyone in your home happy right now. And if you say, I like pianos, be prepared for your home to look like this for the rest of your time. No one wants that. Second of all, this will not be a sermon where I teach you about how to maximize every hour of quarantine so we can be successful. I'll never preach a sermon like that. Odds are, if you're feeling like now is the time that I have to learn all of the skills, you're kind of like me and you like to avoid the bad and sad feelings. Like early on in quarantine, I made a whole list of all the things that I was going to accomplish. I've gotten rid of that list. Third of all, this is not a sermon for someone who has insert specific style of life here. If you are a single person who is renting a room from strangers, there's something in this for you. If you are a parent with a ton of kids running around the house, there's something in this for you. And if you are crushing it at the grandparent game, there's something in this for you. Because anytime the church gathers, even if it's from a distance, there's something in it for all of us. Even if it causes us to think about a situation differently or it stretches us a little bit, or it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. There's something in it for all of us. We're going to camp out in a verse today known as Deuteronomy 6. And if Bible reading is super new to you, this book of the Bible will be towards the beginning. And if you don't have a paper Bible, but you really want one during this time of quarantine, here's my email address. Email me. I would love to, we will figure out how to get you a paper Bible if that's what you need right now. There are some other ways, though, that you can find this, this passage that we're going to be in. One, there's an awesome app called YouVersion that you can download. And then you can, you can type it in and go there, but you can also look up Bible studies and search for specific words. It's an awesome tool. You can also just Google the verse and it'll show up. Um, the verse will also be on the screen today, and I'm a pretty okay reader, so we should, we should be okay together. Now, anytime we read the Bible, it is important for us to be on the same page, especially in terms of the backstory and to understand what's happening. We've got quite a bit of backstory to cover here together, so brace yourselves. When you go through and you read the Bible, you will find that it is broken into two major sections. There's the Old Testament and there's the New Testament. And the Old Testament chronicles for us what it was like for people to pursue God and for God to pursue humans before Jesus came to earth. And the New Testament begins with Jesus showing up on earth and then living a perfect life and going to the cross and and dying for the forgiveness for our sins and then raising three days later. And then it's for us, what does it look like now for humans to pursue God and for God to pursue humans? And we tend to spend most of our time in the New Testament because it's what feels practical. It's what makes the most sense. But in the Old Testament, there's so much wisdom and there's so much evidence of God's love. And so that's where we're going to be camped out today together. And the book of Deuteronomy contains different speeches and different things that happened while Moses was leading the Israelites. And the Israelites were known as God's chosen people. Because they were tasked with with telling the world about how much God loved them and how much God cared about them and what it would mean to live lives that brought him glory and honored him. The Israelites were in a covenant or a contract with God. And I'm just, I'm really giving you like a flyover version here. I encourage you to go back to read this, to study and to learn. At one point in time in the Israelites' history, um, they were enslaved by Egypt And God frees them and uses Moses to lead them into freedom. And they were going to have to spend some time wandering in a desert area. Now, here's the deal. That's because there weren't things like trains and cars and airplanes to get them places quickly. And during this time of wandering and waiting, before they got to go to what was known as the promised land, they got a little frustrated and they got a little antsy because they weren't entirely sure what it looked like to worship God in this new season. 
So they gave up. And they went back to worshiping their old gods. And because of their decisions, the current generation of the Israelites weren't able to enter the promised land. Brutal. That meant that their wandering and waiting went from a little bit of time to 40 years of waiting, trying to live their lives, but not really sure how long they would be stuck in this space and not really sure what to do or what life would look like. Does that sound familiar? Did I just describe quarantine to you? The Israelites had to wander in the desert for 40 years. You're pumped because you're not wandering in the desert, and this is what quarantine, wandering, and waiting looks like for you. You're welcome. So that gets us to where we are in Deuteronomy 6. Moses is giving a speech to the Israelites. Let's read what he says. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised. They are getting ready to enter the land that they had long been wandering and waiting for. And this is Moses' moment to just like hype the Israelites up. Can you imagine how exciting it was? Like they're all gathered around and Moses is like, hey, I just want to let you know that when you enter, I'm going to tell you what it is that you need to do so you can stay faithful to God. So the mistakes that previously happened aren't going to happen again. And so for generations, people will know about God and his love. And they're like, yeah, we can't wait. It, the excitement in that space must have been contagious. And they were probably thinking that it would have been something grand that they had to do. Like this one big, crazy, cool, awesome thing that was going to wrap up super well. I remember being young and thinking about middle school and like being a teenager. Um, and all of my ideas about being a teenager came from the Disney Channel. And I would get to like go to school and something cool or dramatic would happen. And at the end of uh, the 30 minute episode, which would be my 24 hour day, my friends would show up at my house, even though they didn't have cars and, and everything would like work out. Everything would make amends. I thought that being a teenager would be so grand. And they thought that being faithful to God would be this one big grand thing that they would do. And this is what Moses tells them. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So here's what God has asked the Israelites to do. He has asked them to live normal, average, everyday lives, not have to do something grand and incredible, but that in their normal, average, everyday lives, that they would honor him in everything that it was that they were doing. What a buzzkill moment. What a like, oh, we're in this for a long time thing. I kind of think about it um, when I've seen my friends get married in the conversations that we've had where it's like, yeah, I can't wait to just like be with my spouse all the time and we're just going to do such a good job of taking care of one another and we're going to be such a cute married couple and they get up in front of their friends and they vow like, I'm going to love you so much because they just think about all of like the cute fun stuff. But they forget that like, oh, I also have to love this person when they don't put the dishes in the dishwasher and they wait until Sock Mountain erupts for them to finally put their clothes, like their clean clothes away. I might be guilty of both of those things, but they're still pledged to love them. That's what, that's what God has asked of the Israelites, that in everything they do, they love him and they bring him glory. It wasn't about doing one amazing, super cool, spectacular thing for one time only and then forgetting about God. It was about the million little things. Because one big thing doesn't matter if the one million other things speak against it. And that's what God wanted of the Israelites. 
And we talked back in January um, in a series that we did called New Year, Same God, where we walked through what it looks like to love God with all of your heart and soul and strength. And we actually looked at a verse um, from the Gospel of Mark, and they also talk about mind. And so those things were addressed in that series, and I encourage you to go back to rainierview.org, listen, ser- listen to that series. It was an awesome conversation that we got to have. But then what do the rest of those verses mean for us and our homes, for the spaces where we feel comfortable and the spaces where we have influence? It means that when you or I say, I love God, our actions have to actually line up with that. Verse 8 talks um, about tying scripture to your hands and your foreheads. And actually, in, in the Jewish faith tradition, people actually do that. They have these things called phylacteries that they attach to their foreheads and to their hands. And I'm not saying that you have to do that, but I'm saying we've got to look at what's the heart behind it. The heart behind it is that their thoughts need to be shaped by God. And their actions, as they reach forward to do something or interact with someone, it needs to be shaped by God. It needs to be about bringing God glory and not bringing ourselves glory. It shouldn't shock your kids, your friends, your family members when they find out that you're a Christian. If you carry yourself in such a way that creates grace for others and freedom and loves them really well, then when they learn about God, those things should line up. The decisions that you make should be about helping others meet Jesus, not about your own gain. And if we're honest, that feels super overwhelming. All of those things I just listed feel super overwhelming. Maybe it doesn't feel overwhelming for you, but if it does, then that also means that you're probably like me. And when you get a list of things that someone tells you you should do, you begin to think about how can I do this? What does it look like for me and my strength and my knowledge to accomplish these things? And that's not what I'm asking. That's not what's being asked at all. It's about taking your life and laying it before God and turning to him and entering into a partnership with him. It's not about you being super cool or awesome all on your own, but it's about your life displaying to those around you what it means to love God. And it starts in your home right now. See, Moses was hyping the people up before they got to actually enter the promised land. And this is me hyping you up. Your home can be a place where the power of God exists, where the sacrificial love of Jesus is is displayed and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit helps all of those in your home. But it has to start now. Moses didn't tell them to wait. Like he didn't wait till they entered the promised land to be like, hey, your life needs to bring God glory and your home needs to be a space of that. He, waited, he, he told them before they got there. And so I'm telling you now, before quarantine ends, don't panic about decluttering your bookshelves or installing those lights that have been sitting in your closet for a long time. Instead, begin to take the steps to make your home, even in the smallest of ways, a place where God's love is evident. You might be asking, why? For the same reasons we have to start now is for the same reasons it had to start for the Israelites. See, in their wandering and their waiting in the desert, while it was frustrating, they saw God show up in incredible ways, in new ways that they had never seen before and they would have never seen without that time of wandering and waiting. And God is showing up in our lives right now in ways that we couldn't have planned for. I think for all of us, our illusion of Control or whatever version of control we had is gone. God is showing up in your home in a new way right now because people are around more or people are around less. Our dependence is so much more on him than it ever has been on us. And I wish I could know what was happening in all of the Israelite homes. I wish I could know about the prayers that they prayed when their loved one was sick or they were fighting with someone they cared about, or when they were just praying for joy to show up when they had gone through a season of sadness. We don't have those stories. We don't have the individual stories and prayers of all of the Israelite people. But just because we don't have those stories, it doesn't mean that they didn't matter. And God is doing incredible things in your home right now. And my fear is that if we wait until after quarantine, We'll forget about those things. 
We won't make them part of our daily rhythms and routines if we wait until after we go back to normal to begin to make our homes places where God's glory is known. And what happens in your home matters. Odds are no historian is going to stumble upon this sermon or my Instagram page to see how I handled COVID-19 in my personal life. It won't shape the grand story of how Washington or the U.S. or the world responded to this pandemic. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. On my good days, I believe that everything that happens in my home as a single person who lives alone matters. Because Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life and died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins and for yours. The fact that we are created means that there is inherent value in each person, which means that happens in your, what happens in your home matters. Quarantine does not change what was made true on the cross, even if it feels like it does. So here is what I want for you. I want you to make two lists this week. Essentially, I want you to answer these two questions. One, what kind of home have I currently created? L look at your home. I'm not talking about the aesthetics, but when people enter your home, do they feel safe and comfortable? Not right now, right? No one's supposed to be entering our homes right now. But maybe you do live with other people. When your loved ones show up, do they feel safe and loved? Do they have space to ask the tough questions to explore what it means to follow God? When people leave, do they feel like, I just learned something more about God? Or do they leave feeling refreshed or do they leave feeling defeated? I want you to be able to answer that question. We can't begin to change things if we don't actually know where we are. And here's the second question. What do I want my home to be like? You get to dream really big here. What's the end goal? What would it look like far down the road for people to enter and have an opportunity to meet God in your home? But also be specific because there are ways that people can encounter God in my home that can't happen in your home. And there are things that can happen in your home that can't happen in my home. So be specific. Look at the gifts and the things that are around you and begin to dream about it. And then once you have both of these lists, pray. Ask God to reveal things to you, to convict you, to change your heart about how you view your home. Is it just something for you to, to hold so closely and carefully and not be generous with? Let God show up in these spaces and then begin to take those actions, right? Because it's a partnership. Because God begins to change our hearts and we change our actions out of it. May you come out of quarantine not having watched everything on Netflix and with a perfectly organized kitchen, but with a home and a space that screams the love of God is enough. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for the ways that you are showing up in this season. For the new ways, for the challenging ways. May we right now commit to those ways being part of our lives once quarantine is over. May we begin to make changes and shifts in ways that the people around us can encounter God in incredible ways. God, you do not waste any time. And so may we not waste this time, not in looking cool or being awesome, but in growing closer to you and helping others learn about you. I pray for the people that are watching this, for open hearts and open ears and open eyes to see what is currently happening in their home, and then for big dreams about what could come. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, my name is Mike Prejo, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Rainier View. So Erica just closed out our series called Influencers, and I wanted to invite you to our brand new teaching series starting next week called Alternate Ending. Have you ever felt blindsided by life before? Like things are just going fine and then chaos erupts around you and you're starting to wonder, where is God in the midst of everything? 
Well, the good news is that he hasn't gone anywhere. And in fact, he is actively working for our good in those times. So please join us as we dive into some life-changing truths in our new series, Alternate Endings. Hey, in a moment, we're going to be uh, taking some time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus through a time of communion. And so if you or your family, if you've got bread and juice ready, you can go and grab that right now. Uh, and if you're not going to be taking part in communion today, thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of the service. And we hope you have an awesome week. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed these past few months as we've been worshiping in our homes while, while I miss you guys, I've actually really loved taking communion with, with my family at home and, and we've got these goofy little, you know, Dixie cups that we pour grape juice into and we, we find whatever bread that we have in the house and we tear up whether it's a hot dog bun or the, the end of a loaf of bread or whatever it is, but, but it's a time where we gather together and, and then we go to our different parts of the house. Sometimes I'll go outside, sometimes I'll go into my office, different places, but, but I love the time because I can take as much time as I need to go and just to think about what God did for me personally. You know, and sometimes on Sunday mornings when we gather together, it almost feels like I have to rush through that time. And so right now, it's, it's really beautiful that, that we can take as much time as, as we want to take to be able to, to think about the sacrifice of Jesus, how he willingly gave up his entire life. And he allowed himself to be sacrificed. He allowed himself to die on a cross so that we could become children of God. And so we take this time, and I encourage you, take as much time as you want to take the bread that represents his body that was sacrificed on the cross, to take that, that cup of juice, to remember the blood that was spilled so that we could be forgiven, and just, just rest in the knowledge of how much God loves you. And this is a natural time that if maybe there's some stuff going on in your life that you need to confess before God and repent of, now is the right time to do that, to be able to give that over to him, knowing that he has already forgiven you. But in the act of confession, we're simply agreeing with what God has already declared. So be blessed in this time. We love you, church.